Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday night Bible study and prayer meeting of Calvary Pandan BP Church. Let's look to God in prayer before we sing our first and only hymn. Let us pray. Almighty God, our merciful, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the return of this night of the study of Thy Word and of prayer. Cleanse us and wash us of all our sins by the blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we approach Thee once again this evening to worship, to praise Thee, and to listen and obey Thy Holy Word. Forgive us, O Lord, of all our sins. In Jesus' name we give thanks and pray. Amen. 322. 3, 2, 2. 322. Trusting Jesus. 3, 2, 2. Congregation, please stand as we sing 322. Trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Brightly doth His Spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. While he leads, I cannot fall, trusting Jesus, that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him, whatever befall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Singing, if my way is clear, praying, if the path be drear, if in danger for him call, trusting Jesus, that home, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is home, trusting Him while life shall last, trusting Him till earth be past, till within the jasper wall, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Let us pray. Our most merciful, gracious, loving, holy, heavenly Father, we thank Thee for salvation grace so rich and so free that You have bestowed upon each and every one of us. For we acknowledge that we are undeserving sinners, totally depraved, undone, enemies of God. And in this sad state of transgression, You look down from heaven and have pity on all of us. And in that great love, You send forth Thy only begotten Son, 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to live in obedience to all thy laws and then uh, to allow himself to be led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was persecuted, he was crucified, and he died on the cross for our sins. We thank thee, O Lord, that you accepted all that Jesus had accomplished for us at Calvary when you raised him from the dead for our justification. And it is in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, that we approach thy throne of grace and mercies once again this evening. May thou hallowed and bless this hour of worship and the study of thy holy word and later on in prayer for Jesus' sake and incline thy ears to hear our cry and may thy holy word fall on good ground, sanctify every heart, helping us to conform more and more to the image of thy only begotten Son, especially in these last days. For we ask all these things with thanksgiving and for thy glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our text tonight is Genesis chapter 6, verse 14 to verse 22. Genesis 6, verse 14 to verse 22. And the title is Hearer and Doer of God's Word. Hearer and doer of God's word. Genesis 6, 14 to 22. Please allow me to read to you from God's word. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shall thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof. With lower second and third stories shall thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male, male and female." of fowls after their kinds, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep, thee, keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. Amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. Hearing God's word is a privilege that we all acknowledge. But sometimes it comes with a danger. Because we think that by simply hearing God's word, such as attending worship, attending Bible studies, or any of the fellowship groups that we have where the word of God is preached or taught, we think that we are automatically right with God by our mere attendance. Even during our attendance, we pay close attention and we are able to accept and agree with the right teaching and interpretation of the particular text. And even after we have acknowledged that we have now understood this text better after the message, we feel very good about ourselves because... We have obeyed God's word. In a way, it is true. God did use the word here many, many times, especially in the Old Testament, concerning hearing his word. But the word here, or shama, in the Old Testament in particular, always include the meaning or the idea of obedience. That's doing. This is how the word shama is usually used and understood by the hearer in the Old Testament times. Hearing God's word may make us feel good only if you take the next step. And that is, you do it. You live your life in accordance to the word of God that you have 
been studying and learning and agreeing with. Because if it does not result in a actual obedience, because hearing and doing basically equal obedience, then it is a very sad tragedy because to have heard the voice of God and then to say that we have understood the voice of God and then we stop there and we do not follow one very important final step and that is obedience, walk with God, which was what God said about Enoch and about Noah. And so hearing and doing the word of God is very, very important because that is the true measure of a child of God. Not just hearing, but doing as well. And so from verse 14 to verse 17, we realize that doing God's word, when it is something that we are in agreement with, is not an issue. We are very, very delighted and happy to obey what we are very ready to do. We agree with God. But there will come a point in time where the obedience to the word of God may bring about persecution, bring about opponents, people that may hurt us or harm us, or people whom we have an affection for who may be upset and angry with us if we obey God's word and disobey what they desire and make them unhappy. That is, I believe, the true test of obedience. Not those easy passages in the Bible where you're already predisposed to say yes to and then live it out. But it's those moments in our lives where we are asked by God in very clear terms from Scripture, and you know it, that to obey Him will bring about a lot of attacks, a lot of flack, as they say. And so what we see from verse 14 to verse 17 of this passage is obeying the impossible. Actually, I was thinking of using the word obeying the ridiculous. But the impossible. Why would God ask Noah when he was 500 years old, which I believe that he would take about 100 years to complete, constructing this humongous ark? The dimensions were given to us. And if you were to compare the dimensions of this ark in terms of its square footage, you will be amazed that it is too large for just a family of eight. And to top it off, in those days, they never had any rain. The Bible tells us that the mist come up of the ground to water the face of the earth. And then to preach that rain will come down from heaven, that is, water will come down from heaven, was never seen before. And then to prove that the message that Noah preached, that he believed in, he was commanded by God to build this ark. And so the dimensions were given to us. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark. Not a problem up to this point in time, isn't it? And shall pitch it within and without with pitch. That means make it watertight. Still, no, not a problem. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, that is 450 feet. That is very, very large and long. Much bigger than the length of this sanctuary. And then the breadth of it, 50 cubits, that is 150 feet, and the height of it, 30 cubits, that is 45 feet. And divide by three, because we know that from verse 17, verse 16, there will be three stories. So you divide by three. So there will be 10 cubits each, or about 15 feet per floor. Each dB flat is about 10 feet or less, two point something meters. 10 feet is about three meters, roughly. You multiply this in terms of its volume and square footage. And it will be very, very ridiculous for Noah to construct this ark on an earth that had never seen rain. They have water, they have sea, but no rain. 
And this ark was never designed to move like a ship that is wedged at the bottom, like a V-shape. This is flat bottom. It is designed to just simply float because this is no ordinary flood. This is a flood that will cover the entire face of the earth. And so therefore, it makes no sense to build this ark with a V-shaped bottom. The V-shaped bottom is designed to travel fast and to cut across the sea, the waves. But this was not designed for such. It is simply for survival. A window shall thou make to the ark, because there's nothing for Noah to see. Everything will be covered by water. There will be just simply a window at the top. Everywhere else, no need for have, to have any window. It will be sealed tight. And in a cubit shall thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof. That's it. Lower second and third stories shall thou make it. And that's it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. This was what God said to Noah, and you and I have to assume that this would be what Noah would say to his generation as he began construction. Right? To tell them, they ask you, why are you building this humongous ark, Noah, in the middle of nowhere? And it is flat bottom. I'm not sure whether they had shipped in those days, but this was a ridiculous structure, so huge for just eight of you, because water is going to come and destroy this earth, every single human being. There are those professing believers who mock and make fun of Noah's flood in terms of this is not a global flood, this is a local flood, they would argue. And these are the people who believe in the evolutionary theory because if there is a global flood, their calculation of the age of this world of ours would be thrown out of sync. Because of a global flood, all the surface of the earth will be disrupted and then their so-called rate of dis decay that they use to measure how old this piece of stone is, how old this piece of wood is, will no longer hold water. They need to have constancy in terms of the rate of decay. But if there's a global flood and the surface of the earth is all affected, as you will see later on in succeeding chapters, because the earth of Noah's time was not the earth of our time, because God will have to push all the mountains up to what we see today in our world in order to contain all the water that will now collapse from the heavens above onto the earth below. Remember creation? When God uh, separated the waters above and the waters beneath with the firmament, that is our atmosphere. And so this water above that got separated at the beginning of creation will now fall onto this earth. So now all the water that was supposed to be separated and got divided up above and beneath, and now all of them will be on earth. And so God had to push the land up to such a height so that all the waters that are now above are now on earth will go all the way down to what we now call to the bottom of the ocean. And that's why they said, those who use satellite images, that the depth of the ocean is deeper than the height of Mount Everest to contain the waters. And so those who reject the global flood in their foolishness will use their foolish calculation and say that based upon the surface of the earth and based upon all the volume of water that we have today, there is no way there could be a global flood to cover the highest mountain, which is Mount Everest. And that is based upon the assumption that the world of Noah's time was the same world of our time. And based upon this faulty assumption, they make fun of the scripture because they cannot allow a global flood for them to hold on to their theory of evolution. 
But the Lord made it very clear. Did he not? In verse 17. Everything that is in the earth shall die. Everything that is in the earth shall die. Of course, the sea creatures are excluded. See how specific God is? That's why God did not tell Noah to bring in all the sea creatures. They all will survive. And when the flood came, you must understand God is so wonderfully careful and amazing. The whole ocean, the whole world will cover with water. One part of it will be fresh water, one part of it will be seawater. God will make sure of it because that's why we have some sea creatures that survive in fresh water, some will survive in seawater. And God will make sure that they will not mix so thoroughly that the whole earth will be full of only seawater and no fresh water. God will make sure. He is the creator. He controls the universe. He controls the flood. He will decide when it will come. He is the one who divided the waters above and the waters beneath. And what is so difficult for us to accept and understand, knowing how great and how powerful God is, if He can divide it up and split it up, He can easily bring it back down. Easily. By His just timing. I will no longer allow man to live more than 120 years. And so 20 years later, God said to Noah, you now will begin building. He was 500 years old. And by the time he was 600, the flood came. And it lasted for about a year. Not the flood water that keeps coming down, but he will remain in the ark for about a year before the Lord said, you can now come out now. Will you obey the Lord when it is something that the world may laugh and mock at? Will you obey the word of God when it is something that you find it may be even ridiculous? This is definitely a global flood. If it is a local flood, God could just simply tell Noah to just migrate somewhere else. There is no need for him to build this humongous craft. And God was very specific in terms of the dimension. The ark was built to keep God's children alive. Of course, this would be a symbol of our Savior. Of course, in the last days, the world would be destroyed by fire and the only safety is not going to be an ark. It will be only in Christ Jesus. Eight souls will be inside. Something that is going to be mocked at, laughed at. Will you still obey? If the Lord asks you to give this track to someone that may result in some mockery, some shouting, some minor persecution, would you still do it? Will you obey the Lord? Because isn't that the real test of obedience? Not in times of safety and comfort, we obey easily and readily. But in times of adversity, where you know by obedience, hardship, threats may follow suit. Mockery. Calling you all kinds of names, even by your own friends and loved ones, simply because you want to be holy, as your God is holy, according to Scripture. Obedience is something that we all must bear in mind because it is a covenantal sign. Do you know that? Obedience is a covenantal sign between you and your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God the Father. When you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, you have entered into a covenant with God, and God is a keeper of covenant. Throughout the scripture, God always keeps his covenant because he is a God who keeps his word. He cannot lie. These are all the words that are used to describe what a covenantal God is. What he says, he will surely do. And when you enter into an agreement with him, a covenant with him, and in our context, when you accept the Christ as Lord and as Savior, the covenant we entered into is sealed by the blood of Christ. And whatever he has promised us, he will never, ever break. Not even for a moment. Not even in the slightest. 
And so he assured Noah, after he gave Noah this instruction, you think the Lord doesn't know that from now onwards, as Noah began to collect all the material, and then he probably will have to hire a lot of people to help him build this ark, according to God's dimensions and description. You think the Lord doesn't know that Noah will going to be laughed at and mocked at even from his own family members, perhaps, or from his friends? So the Lord said to him, But with thee will I establish my covenant. I will make sure, I will make sure the covenant, the word of God that I have promised you, you walk with me, you obey me. You do what I tell you to do, no matter how impossible or ridiculous it might be in the eyes of men. But you, you do it. Even though you may not fully understand it at this moment in time, but when the flood started to come, when the raindrops started to fall, then as Noah remained inside the ark with his family, I'm sure he will really, really finally understood exactly what God had meant and intended in these early verses, which will only be instruction. The next few verses that follow after chapter 6 will be the construction. You know, sometimes at that very moment in time, we may not realize and understand, but we have to trust Him. We have a covenantal God who knows the future and controls the future, including our future, in a very particular way in every believer's life. Your future is in His protective, loving hand. Know that. When He make a covenant with us, He will never, ever break it. To break it would make him no longer God. He will cease to exist. Please understand how important and significant it is to yourself and to God when you say you have accepted Christ as Lord and as Saviour, you have entered into a covenant with him just as Noah had entered into a covenant with God. And that's why the Lord made it clear to him, I will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So he knew that his family, his immediate family members were all believers. They believe in the message of God preached through Noah. They believed. And the Lord knew. The Lord knew exactly who are the ones whom he had entered into a covenant with. Always, all the time. Today too. That's why it is so important for us all to make sure of our salvation. Our salvation is a covenantal relationship that we have with God and God with us. And so when God gives you His word, just as He now gave this word to Noah, I'm going to destroy this world. Every square inch of this earth will be covered by water. But you, because I have a covenant with you, I will keep you safe. But your safety will depend upon your obedience in the construction of this ark. And it has to be constructed exactly as what I have told you, otherwise it will not work. If he forgets to pitch it inside, only outside, or pitch it inside, forget to pitch it outside, there will be a problem. He must follow instruction, very, very carefully given instruction. Because God will make sure that he protect his children, no matter how the world will come under his judgment and destruction. You're afraid that the Lord said he's going to destroy this world by fire, that the Antichrist will one day rise and become the ruler of the world, and everyone who does not have his mark will not be able to buy or sell. There will be global starvation to anyone and everyone who hold on to their faith. You're afraid of persecution or are you going to trust in the Lord? Are you afraid that when you are hauled up to court to defend your faith, that you may not know what to say and you are nervous and frightened when the Lord has assured us, just as he assured the disciples, when that time comes, I will give you the words to speak. You do not have to worry. 
when the time comes. Right now, you envisage, you theorize in your own mind that if you stand in front of this judge or that judge, oh, I'll be dumbfounded, I don't know what to say. Yeah, when you theorize that and you, all these hypotheses that you have in your mind, you become very nervous and very frightened. You just trust in the Lord, live day by day. And don't project in your mind all kinds of theory based upon this present measure of faith that you have. When the Lord knows your faith is strong enough to face this kind of trial, He will give you this kind of trial because He knows your faith can cope at that point in time, but not now. So therefore, it makes no sense for us to frighten ourselves and make ourselves nervous within our own heart to theorize and then project and imagine what is scenario or that scenario, and then you feel so downcast, I'm going to collapse. Don't do that to yourself. Just trust in the Lord, just as He assured the disciples. The Lord was leaving them. They will now be on their own in their obedience to God's word, which the Lord knows they will obey because of the covenantal relationship. And then they are going to face the enemies of God without Jesus Christ on earth to shield them and to protect them. And so the Lord had to comfort and assure them, do not worry, do not distrust my protection and my promises to you. Have faith. Obey. Obedience is covenantal and evidence of a union that you now have with God that is sealed by the blood of Christ that can never ever be broken. Know that. No fire from heaven, no walls of the devil, nothing anyone can do on earth can ever, ever break this covenantal relationship that God has with all his children, each and every one of them, sealed by the precious blood of his only begotten son at Calvary's cross. That's why hear and obey God's word is such a joy, especially in times of adversities, because once you obey in the darkest, most painful moment of your life and you still pass the test, you know how wonderful it is for you to know experientially that you can trust God not only in times of plenty, in times of health, but more so in times of sickness, in times of adversities, in times of war. That kind of experience is priceless because it will secure your faith and give you that kind of assurance that the devil can never take away from you where you will doubt your own salvation. That's why the Lord assured Noah, I will establish my covenant and you will be safe. You just do what I tell you to do, no matter what others may say or do to you. You remain faithful and you persevere to the very end in the construction of this ark. And once you have done so, the Lord says in verse 19 to verse 22, because obedience has to be absolute, every jot and tittle. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark. Remember, they still have dominion. The animals, they do not fear man until Genesis 9. We looked at that before. If you recall, when God gave man now permission to eat meat, God said, I'm going to put the fear of man in the animals, in the birds, and in the fish. But at this juncture, you call them, they will come readily. So two of every sort that thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee together with you, and they shall be male and female for future reproduction. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto, unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. So this was a very simple and yet enormous and very challenging mission. Get all the animals. Some people say, well, how can they get dinosaurs inside? They are so tall, they are so big. See, Noah is not a fool. The purpose is for reproduction, isn't it? Why would he get two grandpa and grandma dinosaur, right? It makes no sense. Just bring two baby dinosaur. Isn't it true? Baby dinosaur will not eat 
the way that grandpa and grandma would eat. And so, just bring two baby male, female dinosaurs of every kind, as the Lord commanded. And there were more than room enough, three stories, 450 feet long. Easily can accommodate all of them, plus all the food that no one needed to feed his eight persons and all the animals, birds, creeping things. Easily. And that's what he did for the next one hundred years. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Just one sentence to summarize his obedience. He heard the word of God. He did it. No matter how enormous, no matter how ridiculous it may be to the eyes of man, he obeyed. And with God's covenantal assurance that you will keep you safe, I will keep you safe, even when the world begins to be destroyed by me. You obey me, you will be safe. Your life is in my hands. Sometimes we fail to know and remember that very often God may use food and water to keep this body alive. But understand that God is not dependent upon food and water to keep any one of us alive. Please know this. Our survival, the strength in our body, is not because of the food and the nutrients and all the vitamins you take, all the careful drinks that you take. It's the Lord it's doing. He may use these things to give us the strength that we need to do His work and His will. That we so decide not to use any of these things? You think He cannot give us the same strength, even more, even greater strength? You ask Daniel, Remember what he asked the eunuch who was supposed to supervise and oversee their food to make sure that at the end of their three years of training, they would be healthy and strong to serve the king of Babylon. But because it was food offered to idols, he refused. And then he asked, 10 days, just let us eat vegetable and drink water. No alcohol, nothing, just water and vegetable, and see whether our body or demeanor will be any less, weaker, worse, than all the rest who will eat the king's food and drink the king's drink. And lo and behold, after 10 days, they were healthier, stronger, fitter than all the rest. The Lord's doing. It's not the law to teach us you know, to be vegetarian, you know. I hope that's not your conclusion. It is the Lord's doing. If that is not good enough for you, ask Moses. Forty days and forty nights up on top of Mount Sinai, those who have climbed Mount Sinai know how difficult it was. Up and down, dangerous. And yet this man, 80 plus years old, no food, no drink, nothing, communed with God, forty days and forty nights up on Mount Sinai. When he came back down, he was upright, he was strong, he was still very, very alert and very, very healthy. He was not crawling and he was weakened. None of these things. And he did this how many times? Four times. Of course, twice up on Mount Sinai. The other four inside a tentage, praying, interceding because of the severity of the transgression of the Israelites. No food, no water. The Lord sustained him 40 days and 40 nights. And his body was not weakened in any way because when he was 120 years old, the Lord tells us his eyes were not dim and his body was still very fit and strong. How come? Because the Lord kept him. The Lord can keep all of us and allow us to live 100 years, 120, 150 years if he so desire and give you all the strength you need. Remember, this body can live eight, 900 years in the time of Noah. Same body. Imagine that. And now God alone was the one who will cut it down by tenfold, three score years and ten. Remember the psalm written by Moses? Three score years and ten. By reason of strength, add another ten more years. It's the Lord. And so trust Him. 
When you see the world in its economy, whatever fluctuation, whatever issue with all the war and all the noises and all the words and counsel of man, don't fear, don't panic. These are the voices of the world that will try to diminish your faith and your trust in the Lord. Just trust in His Word. You have a covenantal relationship with God. He will keep you safe regardless of the external circumstances, even a circumstance that is as bad as the whole world covered by water, where nothing will survive except the sea creatures. And yet, God said, I have plans for you, Noah, and your family. I will keep you safe and alive. This is how you do it. Obey me and you will survive. And they did. Because obedience is absolute. Not 99.9%. .9%. It has to be absolute. That's the idea of the word obedience. It's an absolute word that has absolute meaning. You cannot say 99.9%. .9 God says, you have disobeyed me. You and I have been told about the language and the grammar of the Hebrew language. They only have two tenses, done or not done, that's it. They don't have anything in between, like the English language. No in between, done or not done. And so when someone is given a task, and someone asks you, is it done? Your answer is either yes or no. There is no such thing as percentage. They're not interested in percentage. This is our mindset of percentage completed. And our people are... Encourage, well, at least it is 85% or 95% done, so not so bad. You pat each other on the shoulder. But nor the, the, those who speak Hebrew, they are thinking. See, what is our first language? Usually control, dictate our thinking. I speak only English, so my thinking is always English. If you speak multiple languages, ask yourself, which is your first language? Whatever your first language is, is that's how you think. That's how you reason. That's how you live. That's how you react and respond. For me, it's um, English all my life. That's the only language I know. But for the Jews who spoke Hebrew, done or not done, that's it. So for them, obedience is very straightforward. To obey means I do. To disobey means I don't do. It's not 99% done. 99% done is disobedience. That's why the Bible says he obeyed all that God commanded him, but that's, that's how they understood it. If I obey God, I'm going to do it 100% or not at all. Very simple. Their mentality, their mindset is very straightforward. Simple. Done or not done. And thank God he obeyed. To hear and to do God's word simply means obey him. Because Obedience will be tested in the impossible. Obedience is covenantal. Remember that. And obedience is absolute. 100%. No half measures. No percentage. Just simply obey. That's why the Bible tells us every child of God has a desire in their heart to obey God's word perfectly. And we can. Because that's what obedience is. You know 5% of God's word, then obey the 5% perfectly. Then as percentage increase, then you obey accordingly, perfectly. Now remember, don't confuse sinless perfection with perfect obedience. Sinless perfection means you and I cannot sin. Perfect obedience means we obey every jot and tittle of what we study from God's word. And so the Bible's teaching is, if I have sinned against you, the Bible says you have to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. And if you know someone has something against you and you want to come and worship me, God says, you stop your worship, put aside your gift and then go and patch up your relationship with that person because of you, that person cannot come and worship me because he's angry with you. So you have to be very, very concerned about his relationship with me and you are the issue that prevented him from having a good, peaceful relationship with me. And therefore, you have to go to him and reconcile. And do whatever it takes to reconcile on your part. If he doesn't want it, that's all that you can do. But if he wants it and you do not do it, then you are in disobedience. So God says, go and make right the relationship. And we have to go. Obey. Every believer has this heart. Every time they read God's word, every time they open God's word, every time they hear God's word, obedient heart. This is God's word. I must obey. Of course, make sure that it is rightly preached and rightly explained and rightly understood. Then you obey. 
Obedience, one of the key hallmarks of a person who is born again. And we know because it begins with salvation. And it continues all the way until glorification. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, help us to trust and obey. We thank thee, Lord, for the very word of everlasting life that you have preserved, inspired for all your children, that we do not need to walk with thee in darkness or in doubt, for the word of God is truly the lamp unto our feet to guide our every step and the light unto our path to help us avoid all the dangers and all the pitfalls that our life of holiness will remain and this straight and narrow path that you have set for us according to Holy Scripture will be obeyed by all your children willingly from the heart. We thank you, O Lord, for this wonderful book of life and for giving to us the mind of Christ, enabling us to understand the Scripture so that we can obey thy holy word that we have understood correctly and rightly. For you have promised us with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, helping us to understand God's word. As your sheep, we will hear your voice, and your voice is found in the word of God, and we will follow you all the days of our lives, even unto eternity. Forgive us, O Lord, of all our sins when we have not obeyed thy holy word, and we fail to have this desire to obey thy word perfectly. From henceforth, O Lord, may thy Holy Spirit convict us and bring to remembrance the word of everlasting life and how significant and important it is for us not to be hearers only, but doers of thy holy and precious word of life. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. God bless. Let us break off into our groups for prayer.